Hi there, this is Dr. Benjamin Fergus with Grip Approach, and the purpose of this video series is to discuss the mechanics of the knee during the squat, and in particular, the body weight squat. Like most of the movements that I study in depth, I start by being really frustrated with what I know and what the information available says about that movement. In this case, there's a lot of conflicting information about knee mechanics during the squat. Um, one of the biggest frustrations I had was with a single exercise that's being uh, promoted for improving knee mobility for the squat. And that movement is essentially uh, taking the tibia, the big bone of the uh, lower leg, and internally rotating it towards the center of gravity. So if this is my right foot, this is my center of gravity, uh, the tibia would be internally rotating with dorsiflexion. And that mobilization has been used with the explanation that it's freeing up mobility at the knee joint during the squat. Uh, well, I looked at that and I was trying to find some literature to support that exercise or some biomechanical theory to support that exercise. And what I came up with was some conflicting ideas. Uh, and so we've broken down the squat in detail first to try to answer that question, but also to see what we know and what we don't know about the squat. Uh, so hopefully this provides you a nice overview of the mechanics of the knee, ankle, and hip during a bodyweight squat. And if there are some experts out there that have conflicting ideas uh, with what I'm presenting here or some good literature you can share, uh, we're definitely open to keeping this conversation growing. The first pass of a squat assessment is viewing it as a series of sagittal plane hinges that keeps the center of mass over the midfoot as the body gets closer to the ground. Let's break that down. If we look at the body sideline, we can think of the space between the front of the tibia and the start of the metatarsals as the midfoot. And in general, we want the center of mass, which is both your mass and any external load you may carry, to go somewhere over the midfoot. As we watch the body bend from the side profile, we're going to look at the key hinges and where the center of mass travels on the way down towards the ground. The primary sagittal hinges are the ankle, the knee, and the hip. If we look at this in side profile, we have to hinge at the ankle, at the knee, and at the hip. Those are required. They all have to bend as we squat, no exceptions. The secondary sagittal hinges are the lumbar spine, the thoracic spine, the cervical spine, and the line of the MPJs if those are utilized. These don't have to bend in a squat, but they often do to position the center of mass over the midfoot. The tertiary sagittal hinges exist in the upper extremity if you're carrying an external load, but we're going to focus primarily on the body squat for this evaluation. We can throw away a lot of detail about the squat on our first pass, as there's really only one constant in the squat, and that's that the center of mass must stay over the middle of the foot. If your center of mass goes back too far, you tip over backwards. If it goes too far forward, you may pop up onto the toes on your way to falling over forwards. In the squat, all of the primary hinges are working to position your center of mass over your foot. And all of the secondary hinges contribute to this positioning when it's not possible or via habit. We all need to squat but there is no one uniform or perfect way to do it. We know that increasing the moment arm on a piece of anatomy will increase the force or load on it. Joint alignment and the distance of the anatomy away from the center of mass determines the moment arm during the squat. Some joints, like the hips and ankles, can manage a large amount of load and a large amount of torque. Some joints, like the lumbar spine and the patellofemoral joint, seem to not handle rapid increases in load and torque as well. 
Although low to moderate loads can be handled on any joint in most positions, heavier and more constant loads will be managed more efficiently by the body if we reduce the use of secondary hinges from a simple mechanical standpoint. The secondary hinges help us to fine tune control of movement, especially with accelerations, much like the suspension of a vehicle that helps you to minimize the volume of movement away from the most efficient path, which is what happens with bumps if there's no suspension in a car. So we don't want the spine to be too rigid during the squat but rather to allow for fine-tuned suspension and control through the squat. Conversely, if the spine is too loose, allowing lots and lots of movement during the squat, that's not going to be an efficient movement, and with load, it may have an adverse effect on those joints. So we can't keep the spinal movements too loose or too tight. So let's look at these few breakdowns of the squat looking from side view at the sagittal plane hinge. This first image is a normal or ideal bone length and mobility. So this is assuming that the ratio of the length between the tibia, the femur, and the spine are all beneficial for squatting and that there's adequate ankle dorsiflexion, knee flexion, and hip anterior flexion in order to allow that center of mass to stay balanced over the midfoot. If we make a small change like limiting ankle dorsiflexion, you'll see that in order to keep the center of mass straight over the midfoot, a change has to be made in the hip angle and the positioning of the upper back. In this example, the knee angle of flexion reduced the hip angle stayed the same as the client leans the body forward to balance the center of mass. In this second picture, we also have limited ankle dorsiflexion, but this time the individual used an external mass load or a weight in front of the body. This shifts the center of mass forward, even without a significant change in the anatomical positioning and that allows the individual to get more vertical in the squat even with the limitation of ankle dorsiflexion. Let's look at two other variations. Here's our reference for ideal or standard. And in the second example, this individual with normal anatomy has used a pattern of extreme ankle dorsiflexion with the knees traveling over the toes more than what we would expect for an average squat. This is still possible as the person's able to maintain the center of mass over the midfoot. But what happens is the moment arm on the lumbar spine decreases as it gets closer to the vertical line and the moment arm and torque on the knee increases as it moves further away from the vertical line of center of mass. This may be a nice strategy if somebody has some acute low back pain and still needs to squat. However, for an individual that suffers from knee pain with load, this may not be the best strategy. This next image with the same anatomical lengths the individual is using more of a hips back and higher position. This takes quite a bit of load off of the knee, but increases that moment arm on the back. This individual also has to tip their spine further forward to manage the center of mass over the midfoot. So again, the squat is possible. However, we have to recognize an increase in moment arm and torsional load on the lumbar spine with this type of squat. There are some anatomical variants that we should consider as well. Here's our ideal reference range. There are some individuals that have a very short tibia compared to their femur, or a very long femur compared to the tibia. And these individuals will have to change the sagittal plane mechanics of hinging in order to keep the center of mass over the ankle. In this case, and in most cases where the tibia is much shorter than the femur, the hips are not able to get below the knee length very well, 
and we typically see a large forward lean of the spine similar to what you might see if there is reduced ankle dorsiflexion. In this next case, the individual's tibia is much longer in comparison to the typical femur to tibia ratio. This allows the individual to get very vertical in the squat and still maintain the center of mass over the midfoot. Now this will also have some downfalls as certain weighted lifts will be harder for this individual to achieve uh, with the ratio of short femur. But in general, a shorter femur and a longer torso and longer tibia make the lowest portions of the squat easier to obtain. So if we have a tibia that is short or a femur that is long, it's going to make getting to the lowest part of the squat more challenging because it puts more demand on hip flexion and ankle dorsiflexion to keep the center of mass forward. You can take a long femur like this one and you can make it shorter simply by rotating it away from the hip. You'll see the length of this femur did not change, but it has positioned the center of mass closer to the midfoot by rotating it away from the pure sagittal plane. This is a technique that a lot of individuals use to help achieve depth in the squat when their anatomy does not allow them to get there naturally. This can also be helpful for some with very limited ankle dorsiflexion to achieve the lower portion of the squat. Okay, now that we talked about the basic requirements of the sagittal plane hinging of the spine, we get to focus a little more closely on the knee joint. So I've got a little anatomy here in front of us and it's big to get in the frame, so let's break it down piece by piece. Uh, the lower leg is composed of the tibia, that's the bigger bone, and the fibula on the outer side, so this would be the right leg. And that creates this little plateau on the top with the meniscus that allows the femur to sit and have a little bit of a cushion to glide around and squish and flex against without the bone rubbing and deteriorating on the bone. Top part of the knee joint is the femur, and the front is a really key piece here, uh, which is the patella. This is essentially a floating bone of the knee joint, and this helps to alter the forces on the knee so the knee doesn't collapse or have very odd force through the motion. So if we were just building robots, we might start with just having a simple hinge that went in only in the sagittal plane to allow some flexing. And that is the key activity of the knee is sagittal plane flexion and sagittal plane extension. Uh, but there's a couple key elements here. One, let's see if you can see this. Uh, the shape of the femoral condyles is a little bit different from side to side. And that means that we have the ability to pivot on the meniscus and allow some rotational movement of the knee. Now, at first glance, uh, we may say that rotation of the knee is no good because it will put some strain on the PCL and the ACL ligaments primarily that check some of the forward and backward motion of the knee as well as the rotations. And those are known to uh, have quite a few injuries to them. But our foot needs to use a lot of rotations. In fact, the actions of pronation and supination are triplanar movements. They involve the sagittal, coronal, and transverse plane. And what happens in the foot as we pronate, which is used as uh, one strategy during a squat, is we lower that arch down and the tibia internally rotates as the arch is lowering. So if we have just a simple hinge in the knee that's supposed to bend only in one direction, but the tibia is rotating, then if this is a simple hinge, it will either lock or the upper portion of that body and hip will have to rotate with the tibia.
So that's not ideal. It's not a good biomechanical model if it was only a sagittal plane hinge. In fact, our knee joint is made to accept some rotations in fine-tuning the position of the knee. And that rotation can be a pretty large amount. It's not a small wiggle. We can rotate 10 degrees or so into external rotation and around 20 degrees into internal rotation without much issue or limitation in a normal healthy knee. So we can break down some of the automatic rotations of the knee. Uh, because our lateral femoral condyle is a little bit smaller or positioned posterior compared to the full amount of the medial femoral condyle, what happens during motion is a bit of a pivot using the lateral meniscus as our stationary pivot point, which is a modifiable stationary pivot point. There is some glide to it. And the medial condyle is allowed more gliding activities on its larger surface. As we start to work towards terminal knee extension, the lateral portion of the knee uses up its available motion, yet the medial surface of the knee continues to move, and terminal extension is often matched with an amount of external tibial rotation. That means when the femur is stationary, the last few degrees of extension will allow the tibia to rotate outwards. And that is guided by the ACL and PCL ligaments as well as the shape of the condyles. That's the screw home mechanism of the knee. Now, if you are in that terminally locked tibia ER position of knee extension, then one of the first motions the knee has to do to bend again is to create some internal rotation of the knee to unlock the knee and allow it to bend again. It's just an undoing of that final terminal tibial ER. But once you have that initial unlock accomplished in the first three to five degrees of knee flexion, that motion is no longer strictly required. At that point, the knee is unlocked and can bend and rotate and fine tune throughout the remainder of the squat or bending activity. Now that is maybe a point of contention but I have found no literature that supports a need for tibial IR in any portion of the knee flexion beyond the first three to five degrees. So that's one of the issues I initially have with the tibial IR mobilization with ankle dorsiflexion is one, that movement is being used with ankle dorsiflexion which is very different from the initial movement that's needed to unlock the knee. And two, it doesn't seem to be necessary in other portions of the squat. However, tibial IR with dorsiflexion may be a nice way to increase ankle dorsiflexion range. So from terminal knee extension, there is a small internal rotation of the tibia to allow the knee to begin to bend, to unlock the knee. At that point, once the knee begins to bend, these motions of the knee can be highly variable and still okay, still not dangerous. We've even seen external tibial torsion, uh, excuse me, external tibial rotation on the femur be called dangerous external tibial rotation, which, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So if you look at a knee in terminal knee flexion, even in this position, we can have rotation in external tibial torsion, uh, external tibial rotation or internal tibial rotation without any issue and without much limitation. That's rotations possible. And that lets us know that really, aside from the first three to five degrees of knee flexion from terminal extension, that the rotations of the knee can be highly variable and still be okay. Yet, they provide a lot of insight about what's going well with the squat and what could be improved and 
you need a really good way to read that and understand why you're seeing what you're seeing. And that's when we have to look at what happens at both the hip and at the foot to affect that position. One common coaching uh, cue for alignment is to keep the knee aligned with the foot during the squat. So if this is my surface uh, that my foot's on during the squat, as I go into the squat, most coaches don't want to see the knee go to the inside of the foot or to the outside of the foot. And the cue is simply to track the knee over the center of the foot. And I agree with that. It, it works well for most individuals to protect the knee. And it's uh, mechanically a very efficient way to move the knee. We look at this uh, from another factor as well, which is the tracking of the patella. Now, I don't get super technical in the tracking of the patella, but we do have a pretty nice smooth groove for the patella to sit in, and it seems to work best with the least amount of grinding and discomfort when it can slide in and uh, along that smoothly grooved surface. So when I look at the line of the tibia down the second toe of the foot, I in general wanna keep the femur and patella line within about 15 degrees of that line of the tibia to the second toe. Now that's maybe a technical way of saying we want the knee over the foot, but it gives you another perspective because if this individual is able to keep the shin directly over the foot, they may need to use a large amount of hip external rotation in order to make this alignment work. And in that case, the femur to patella may be pointing 30 or 35 degrees away from the line of the tibia to the second toe. And even though they're using a knee over foot type of cueing, that alignment may not be ideal for the tracking of the patella. And, and that may be part of the reason they're experiencing some of that tracking discomfort or tracking popping of the knee. In this segment of the video, we're going to talk about the terminology of the rotations of the knee. And what I found looking at a lot of the literature and the studies on the knee is that the terminology of what we're looking at as far as rotations at the knee is very poorly defined and uh, it's easy to get confused. So before we make a lot of opinions and, and rehab strategies based on this terminology, let's try to come to some agreement. So if I look at a knee that is extended, and here's our, our hip joint as well on top. Let's just tighten that up. Okay, so here's the hip joint with the knee fully extended. At the hip joint, this movement is internal and external rotation of the hip in standing. This rotation from the hip in and out is rotating the femur in and out on top of the tibia. And if the leg is off the ground, the whole lower extremity may rotate. But if the foot is on the ground, there are two options. Either one, the arch and the tibia are stationary and only the femur rotates on the tibia. Or the arch and the tibia also rotate and then we're looking at the degree of rotation between the two joints. Okay, so we're gonna illustrate rotations of the knee using a mason jar. And I've drawn a little line here representing the tibia and a little line here representing the femur and the patella. Ideally, the knee is capable of about 10 to 15 degrees of rotation in each direction without strain and without issue. And for some individuals, it's a greater amount than that. Uh, what we want to look at is the rotation of the tibia and the rotation of the femur to determine what the rotations are of the full knee joint. Now, if both bones 
rotate internally, that's internal rotation of the knee, plain and simple. And if both rotate externally, that's external rotation of the knee. Uh, but here's where it gets a little bit tricky. If your uh, client is supinating the foot during the squat, then they will have some external rotation of the tibia. But typically, they will also be moving the femur in an external rotation direction. And very frequently, the femur externally rotates in a larger range or at a faster rate than the tibia during the squat. So if we forget about the hip and forget about the foot, that position looks like the tibia is internally rotated on the femur, even though both bones were moving in the same direction. And that's relative rotation. We can take that the opposite way. You may see the tibia internally rotating with pronation of the foot and the femur not rotating as fast. And this may also look like internal rotation of the tibia compared to the femur. But in some cases, the femur internally rotates faster than the tibia does, even though both bones are moving in the same direction. And again, if you forget about the hip and the foot, that looks like external rotation of the tibia compared to the femur. And ultimately, that's okay. That may be what that individual's anatomy needs in order to accomplish a low load squat. So when we look at the actual knee complex, we want to think about the movement of the tibia in rotation and the movement of the femur in rotation and understand are they moving opposite directions or what often happens is they move in the same direction but at different rates and that will look like a larger rotation moment of the knee. When we are in terminal knee extension or neutral knee extension, then the external and internal rotation of the femur and tibia knee joint is also rotating the hip externally or internally in this position. And this is your classic internal and external rotation of the hip. If the foot was off the ground, then this rotation would move the whole limb in or the whole limb outwards. But if you are planting on that foot and it is an anchor point, then the tibia may stay relatively still as we rotate the femur out and in. Now there will be some supination and pronation of the foot as you move from the hip, but the bones, although moving the same direction, would have a relative rotation moment. So in terminal knee extension, our internal and external rotation of the femur is also happening at the hip joint. But here's where it gets a little bit tricky. When we bend the knee to around 90 degrees or below, the rotation in and out at the knee is actually coronal plane movement at the hip. It's hip abduction and hip adduction. Or if this patient is laying on the ground or on your table like this, and you're evaluating for rotation here, what's really key for the knee is not to rotate the lower leg here. What's really key for the knee during the squat is to understand that rotation of the knee at the hip during the squat is actually hip adduction and hip abduction. We put that vertical again. It's hip abduction and hip adduction that, re that create the rotational moments of the knee. So it's important to note that as you squat, when you start to have rotations of the knee, it's true internal external rotation of the hip. And as you progress deeper into the squat, there is less internal external rotation of the hip, 
and more abduction and adduction of the hip as you get deeper into the squat. Now, most of the tibial movements during the squat are going to be determined by what the foot is doing and what the integrity of the arch is. So when we look at the foot, the triplanar movement of foot pronation will always have an element of tibial rotation. Now, remember that pronation is a movement not necessarily a position of the arch. So there can be a low arched individual that is going through a movement of supination, and there can be a high arched or cavus individual that's going through a movement of pronation. And the movement of the arch is what determines the rotation of the tibia, not so much the height of the arch in any position. So as we bring the ankle forward over the foot, there is a movement of pronation and a movement of internal tibial rotation. And that's been studied extensively in walking and running gait, but it has not been studied as extensively in the squat. There's another interesting thing that happens. When you are squatting with both feet, our center of mass is no longer oriented over the medial longitudinal arch the way that it is during portions of walking and running gait. Instead, you have this vertical center of mass and you can align where it loads in the foot via abduction and adduction of the hip. So external rotation of the femur via abduction of the hip is going to allow you to take that center of mass and position it over different parts of the foot. As you position that mass more medially, it will typically create a pronation movement that's paired with tibial internal rotation. And as you position that mass more laterally over the foot, there will typically be a supination movement of the foot that's paired with external rotation of the tibia. Okay, so let's tie this all together into a movement which starts with uh, the knee straight and the center of mass balanced, and it involves actually loading through the foot. As I'm shifting lower into the squat, if my knees are crashing in or rotating in, and I get the cue of knees out or knees over the foot, that's a great way to externally rotate the tibia, but it will often require abduction at the hip in the coronal plane, hip abduction, in order to rotate the femur externally and help to drive the tibia externally and help to drive supination of the foot. Once I get past 90 degrees and start to get further into the deep position of the squat, the actual shape of the femoral acetabular joint has changed its orientation. So for the majority of individuals, as you get deeper into the squat, there needs to be more external rotation and abduction of the hip in order to sink into the terminal squat position. Now there are variations based on femoral torsion and shape of the acetabulum, but as a general rule, the greater degree of hip flexion that's needed, the more femoral abduction is going to be required to generate that position. As we get the femoral abduction in the terminal squat, we're going to be rotating the femur externally, which is going to aid in some external rotation of the tibia to maintain a relatively neutral or partially supinated foot as you get into the deeper part of the squat. Now, there's an additional misconception 
that the further the tibia goes forward will always be paired with more internal rotation of the tibia and pronation of the foot. And although that may be true in some individuals and especially in gait, it is not a rule in the deep squat because we have the ability of pushing the weight to the outside or the inside of the foot, which will help us determine the rotations of the tibia. Now, this whole picture can change with an anatomical variant or an anatomical deformity. Let's say, for example, somebody has a uh, congenital forefoot varus position. That's where when the heel is uh, on the ground fairly parallel, the forefoot would be angled up. Now, in this individual, the forefoot is going to try to reach down to the ground and by doing it, we may create that excessive internal rotation of the tibia. When this individual tries to externally rotate the knee to align the uh, tibia and the knee over the midfoot, they may in fact pop up the first MPJ off of the ground, creating supination and shifting from three points three primary points of support on the foot to two primary points of support on the foot. For simple load bearing, I like to see as much surface area of the foot in contact with the ground as possible. If somebody has, uh, let's say, a very long femur compared to a tibia, they're in general going to do better with a wider stance of their squat. And when you have that wide stance of the squat, bringing the hip into abduction, you're going to be creating more external rotation of the femur on the tibia. And that may get to the limit of that range of motion, which will also draw the tibia externally and potentially over supinate the foot. So there are a lot of variations of the setup of the squat and the coaching of the squat that can change completely what you see at the knee. I think the overriding factor I wanted to discuss in this video is the amount of rotation at the knee is highly variable based on how the squat is set up, where the load is, and what they're trying to accomplish in that deep squat. And ultimately, most of those variations are okay and safe in minimal to moderate amounts of load. But when we start to move heavier objects or we're moving more frequently, we may want to have the benefit of a biomechanically efficient position that puts less shearing torque and load on our spine and our joints that are, are not as well suited for that type of load. And that's where these mechanics and small fine tuning of position can make a big effect. So I'm not an advocate of jamming into internal rotation of the tibia to unlock the knee as it's really only needed uh, from terminal extension to the initial flexion. Uh, however, I can see that that would help with general ankle mobilization. I hope that this overview has shed light on some of the mechanical variations that we see uh, both in the studies and our in-office and in-gym evaluations of the knee during the squat. Um, a, a big point here is to not be afraid of knee movements, but to recognize when there are accelerated knee movements or when some small mechanical setup changes can reduce the adverse load on a sensitive or injured joint. If you have questions or comments about this video, feel free to message me via email or our social media sites. Uh, and ideally, there's a few experts out there that can challenge some of the ideas I presented so that we can come closer to a full understanding. Thanks for tuning in, and uh, we look forward to hearing your comments. Grip approach is a rehabilitation system, but it's primarily an evaluation or a diagnostic method for grading motor control of 
how we move our body in three planes of motion. So I can evaluate a squat purely in the sagittal plane movements, purely in the transverse plane movements, or, or purely in the coronal plane movements, but really uh, an, a squat involves all three planes of motion at the majority of the joints that are at play during the squat. So when I take my first pass at evaluation, I first take a simple look at the mechanics of how they transition the center of gravity down to the ground and say, can these mechanics, not even biomechanics, but can these mechanics work a little more efficiently for the individual? And then we can look at the biomechanical or the neurological component, and that is, does the individual have the potential to control each joint in each movement? Can they elicit full motor output of a position? And that helps us understand whether their nervous system and skeletal muscle can position a joint or get good feedback from the joint to control and fine tune the movement. Um, so when we look at a knee and a knee rotation during a squat, I still am going to ask the question, can this individual drive or control about 10 degrees of external rotation of the tibia? And that's gonna inform me not only about the anatomy involved, but it lets me know, is their brain prepared for this movement? Can it control the movement? Or is it still trying to recover from an injury or underuse? So we apply our grip evaluation to learn a lot more detail about how the individual moves and what the actual limiting factors are. But the initial swipe through a squat evaluation is going to look more at the mechanical aspects of that squat.